Bruchem Aboyim, thank you very much for coming. Um, class tonight will be on second class on Moshe's mission. What I'd like to do is dedicate the class to the um, situation in Israel. Again, God should protect all our brethren. And uh, again, God should bless, bless the Jewish nation. Uh, again, in the merit of the class, again, the schluss should go to them. Uh, so again, we're on the second discussion here of Moshe's mission. So we ended up last week, again, Moshe's at the Israel's house. He's taking care of the sheep, um, again, the burning bush. But so let's begin our, this week. So it seems strange that at their initial encounter, the first command that God gave to Moshe was Exodus 3, 5, where he told Moshe, remove your shoes from your feet. Well, what was God's message? So Moshe was looking into the fire of the burning bush. And he was able to see the suffering that the Jewish nation would experience throughout its entire history. When someone wears shoes, they don't feel the earth beneath their feet. Once they remove their shoes, ah, then they feel every pebble that is on the ground. God was telling Moshe that as a leader, it was essential that he feel the pain of his people and that he must share in their difficulties. We see the same scenario with the priests that served in the temple. Uh, they all served barefooted. They did not wear shoes while they officiated, even though it was cold. This was especially true in the morning, since the temple was on a mountain and the floor was made of stone. To protect them, God had to give them a special blessing so that they wouldn't get sick due to their service. Even today, when the Kohanim blessed the people, they are required to first remove their shoes before they begin the service. We see that shortly before Moshe died, the people complained to him that they had no water. Instead of commiserating with them, he got angry and he called them rebels. He had spent 120 days and nights on the mountain where he didn't eat nor did he drink. The measure says that he was an angel from the waist up and a man from the waist down. He had reached a level in life where he could no longer identify with the average person. Then God told him the time had come for Yoshua to take over the leadership of the nation. When a leader cannot feel the pain of his people, he can no longer lead them. At his first attempt to free the Jews from Egypt, not only does Moshe not succeed, but he actually manages to even make things worse. Why wasn't he successful at first? You know, he had agreed to accept his mission to redeem the Jews only because God had insisted. One of the most important factors in being successful in life is self-confidence. If you don't believe in yourself, well, then you can be sure that no one else is going to believe in you either. Success doesn't necessarily mean that everything turns out perfect. Many times it's a process, but in the end, all the pieces fit, stay the course. The saying goes, if you think that you will fail, well, guess what? You will fail. There's another saying, though, that says if you don't succeed at first, try, try again, and Moshe comes back a second time, and now the redemption begins. We see that he doesn't participate in bringing the first three plagues. The first two that originated from the Nile, the blood and the frogs, and then the third, the lice, that originated from the earth. But why? It says that the water had saved him when his cradle was put afloat in the Nile, and Paro's daughter retrieved it. And the earth had covered up the body of the Egyptian overseer that he had killed. He felt that it would show a lack of gratitude if he were to hit either the water or the earth. Showing gratitude, saying thank you, is great. But the question becomes, how long is one indebted to someone who has done them a favor? Now, the water had helped Moshe when he was a newborn. He was now 80 years old. The same could be said of the earth. It had extended its kindness many years before. Not only that, but the water and the land just did what they were created to do. They really did nothing that was miraculous, and yet Moshe wouldn't strike either. What a lesson we learned from Moshe's action. Once someone has done you a favor, you are indebted to that person forever. Even if they are being paid to render a service, you still need to say thank you and show your appreciation. Again, the concept of thank you. 
We also learn about parenting from the plagues that were brought in Egypt. If you look closely at the wording of the ten plagues, you will notice that only one of the ten happenings brought in Egypt is actually called a plague, Makos Bechoros, the plague of the firstborn. So what were the other nine? Actually, they were instructional events orchestrated by God with the intent of bringing Paro and the Egyptian people to a true state of repentance for their sins. When all the instructional efforts failed then, only then God did God punish the Egyptians with the plague of the firstborn. God wants to wipe out the sin, not the sinner. Moshe was unique among the prophets in that he questioned God. There is a measure that says in Moshe questioned God in a way how, he wanted to know how a benevolent God could allow young children to be plastered into the walls of the buildings that the Jews were constructing. This was done by the Egyptians. If a Jew fell short of their daily quota, quota of bricks, so God told them that all those children that were taken and plastered into walls were those that would be a thorn in the side of the nation if they had lived. But God told Moshe, listen, if he wanted, he could take one child out of the wall and see what his end would be. And so he took one child out of the wall. The child that Moshe selected from those who had been plastered into the wall was Micha. The story is told that when Moshe was looking for Yosef's coffin, he was told by Serach that the Egyptians had sunk Yosef's steel coffin into the Nile. They did so for two reasons. First of all, they saw the Nile as a god, and they saw Yosef as the material provider of the nation, and they felt that the two would be very compatible. In addition, they knew that the Jewish nation couldn't leave Egypt without his coffin. So Moshe found Yosef's coffin, but then he couldn't lift it up from the bottom of the Nile. So what he did was he took a golden amulet, and wrote on it, Alei Shor, Arise Ox. We know that Yosef's sign was the sign of the ox. He threw the amulet into the Nile, and lo and behold, Yosef's coffin floated to the surface of the Nile and rested on the shore next to where Moshe was standing. So Moshe took Yosef's coffin, but he left the amulet. Now, he really didn't think of it, didn't give it much thought. However, Micha, uh, the child he had taken out of the wall in lieu of the bricks, was watching the whole scenario. When Moshe left, Micha went to the water's edge and retrieved the golden amulet with the words written on it, Ale Shor, Arise Ox. When the mixed multitude made the golden calf, Micha threw the same amulet into the fire and out came the golden calf, walking and talking. This gave the calf credibility and some of the people saw it as a god and they began worshiping it. The other cause of the golden calf was the Erev Rav, which means the mixed multitude, the cream of the crop of Egyptian society. They were the intelligentsia. They were the architects, the builders, the brightest and the best that the Egyptian society had to offer. God did not tell Moshe to bring them out with, with the Jewish nation. Moshe did so on his own. But, but the question has to be, why would Moshe do this? It's interesting, if you think about it, that throughout the ages, we as Jews have been called every derogatory name in the book, except one, <laughs> the most obvious. We are never called slaves. But why? The Torah states in less than 50 times, that we were slaves in Egypt to Paro in Egypt, and God redeemed us from there. If you're black, even if your name is Michael Jordan, at some time in your life, someone has referred to you or your ancestors as slaves. I believe that the reason why we never call, we are never called slaves is because of the Erev Rav. These individuals would not have joined a slave nation. However, they would have joined a nation that was enslaved. Moshe took them out with the Jewish nation when they left Egypt to give the Jews credibility, again, to the Jewish nation for eternity. However, we see in many ways that they became a stumbling block in the development of the nation. They did have a positive purpose in that it was the Erev Rav, believe it or not, that forced Paro to chase the Jews to the sea where they met their final end. Paro had not, had not only freed the Jewish nation, he escorted them out of the country and he armed them. 
You don't arm 600,000 men who are going to return in three days. If they're coming back, you don't give them weapons. You send soldiers with them to protect them. It would seem that the heir of Rob had petitioned Paro, saying that the Jews were about to experience great revelations in the desert. This was to be, so to speak, a once-in-a-lifetime event, and they wanted to be allowed to witness the miracles. Paro agreed for them to go, but only for three days, and then they were expected to return. So he sent captains of the guard to accompany them back, but after three days it became evident they were not returning. They had decided to stay with the Jews in the wilderness. Pyro had had enough of the Jews and their God. He thought that, the God, that, the, that God's strength may well be limited to inhabited areas. He saw that although all the idols in Egypt were destroyed, the idol called Baal Zephon, the idol of the north, was still standing, and it stood guard at the edge of the desert. As a prayer, as the, as a, as the prayer that we say da daily, that the Jews sang when they crossed the Red Sea, called the Uz Yashir, then they sang. One of the verses reads that Paro said about the Jews, I will pursue them, I will overtake them, I will divide the spoils, my lust shall be sated upon them, I will unsheath my sword, and my hand shall annihilate them. No. He wanted the Erev he needed them, but the Jewish nation, he wanted to annihilate them. Paro had no choice but to bring the Erev back, since without them, Egypt was lost. The plagues had totally devastated the whole country. He needed their knowledge and expertise to rebuild all of Egypt. He was really desperate. He understood that the survival of his nation was at stake. So Moshe's decision forced Paro and all of his people to meet their final end by drowning in the sea. The Torah doesn't mention people's ages very often, but it does mention that Moshe was 80 years old and his brother Aaron was 83. Not exactly the age that you would think would be conducive for someone to lead a nation through a barren wilderness. Both of them worked tirelessly to serve God and lead the nation. Age? Age never became a factor. Even when Moshe complained to God that he was overburdened by the complaints of the people, his complaint was about the aggravation that he was experiencing. He was not complaining about the work. As we know, nothing wears a person down more than arguments and discord, mental anguish. So Moshe takes the nation to Mount Sinai where they receive the Torah directly from God Almighty himself. The experience becomes too awesome for the people. And they asked Moshe to become their intermediary, their representative. They wanted him to speak directly to God and then tell them what God said. And this is why we say the phrase, Torah Tzivul Anu Moshe, that it was Moshe who taught us the Torah. This is also why we refer to the Torah as Torah Moshe, again, the Torah of Moshe. While in the desert, Moshe is visited by his father-in-law Yitro. He brings with him Sipora, Moshe's wife, and his two sons, Gershon and Eliezer. The name Moshe is made up of three letters, a mem, a shin, and a hey. Now, each of these letters allude to one of Moshe's previous lives. The mem, of course, alludes to his present life as Moshe. The shin alludes to Seth, Shes, the third son born to Adam and Chava, and the hey alludes to Hevel, the second son born to Adam and Chava, who was killed by his brother Cain. One of the reasons given for the two brothers fighting, which brought about the death of Hevel, was over a woman. It seems that, both, that when Cain was born, he was born with a twin sister. And when Hevel was born, he was born as triplets with two sisters. Each one, Hevel and Cain, contended the third sister should be their spouse. The argument ended with the death of Hevel. So according to Kabbalah, Yisrael was a reincarnation of Cain, Moshe was a reincarnation of Hevel, and Sipora was a reincarnation of that third sister over whom the two brothers were fighting. So Yisrael, Cain, coming out to the desert to see his son-in-law Moshe and his bringing his daughter with him was Cain saying to Hevel, I'm sorry for what I did, and I'm returning your long-lost spouse to you. The long arm of time. In the end, all the pieces come together. In the desert, God brings three miracles for the people in the merit of the three shepherds that would guide them 
for the 40 years that they would travel in the wilderness. The Well of Miriam, a sea of water that took care of the needs of at least 3 million people and their animals. The Clouds of Glory, that were brought in the honor of Aaron. They protected the nation on all six sides and a seventh cloud that led them during the day and gave them heat and light at night. And then they were fed with the spiritual food that came from heaven, called man. That came in the merit of Moshe. I find it interesting in that the people never complained about the well or the clouds of glory, but they found the man an affliction. So too the people never complained about Miriam or Aaron, but they had plenty, plenty to say about Moshe. In fact, the Talmud goes so far as to say that they suspected him of having relations with their wives. It is lonely at the top. Finally, the Jews accepted Torah on Mount Sinai. Everything looks great. Moshe goes up to the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments, and he tells the people he'll return in 40 days. Well, what a surprise. Moshe's late. In fact, I think that really is the 11th commandment. Anyways, the people thinking he would not return make a golden calf. When God sees what the people have done, he tells Moshe to go back down. God was telling Moshe that the only reason why he had the merit to stay on the mountain was because of the people. But now that they had sinned, he could no longer stay. His stature had come from them. God wants him to leave the tablets in heaven. Moshe refuses and, so to speak, pulls them away from God and brings them down the mountain. Why didn't he leave the tablets with God in heaven? After all, he had already been told by God himself that the, what the people were doing. They had sinned. So we learn a great lesson here. When it comes to believing bad things about another Jew, one should not believe it until he sees it themselves. Even if one, the one who is telling you is God Almighty himself. So he comes down the mountain with two tablets, as it states in Shabbat Amida, in one hand. The verse in Exodus in the portion of Kisisa 32.19, where it states that he saw the calf, and it says, then he got angry, he threw the tablets from his hand, and they were shattered at the foot of the mountain. The question has to be, why did he have to break them? And why was he so angry? And also, who was he angry at? So the breaking of the tablets can be seen in different ways. First, the tablets were stone and therefore extremely heavy. The only way that he could carry them was much like those who carried the ark in the desert, was with divine assistance. The ark carried those that carried it. So too Moshe with the tablets, they actually carried themselves. So the measure says when the tablets saw the calf, the letters flew back up to heaven by themselves, left thus leaving Moshe with two stone tablets that he could not possibly carry. It does say that Moshe broke the tablets. And the Ramban states that it may well have been that as they were falling from his hand, that he pushed them so they would not fall on his feet. There are others who say that Moshe wanted to shock the people into reality, much like a thief who gets caught in the act. One can only imagine the state of the people when they saw Moshe and then that he broke the holy tablets. They had to be in a state of total shock and confusion. They had to be thinking, what would God do now? The verse states that Moshe was angry, and we know that anger is compared to idol worship. So by getting anger, he placed himself on the same level of the people. They were all culpable. But who was he angry at? The, the people? You know, it was less than a half a percent of the people that served the calf. The real instigators and worshipers were Moshe's own people, the Erevrah. And of course, it was Micha, who threw the amulet into the fire, giving godly-like powers to the calf. The people had just left a culture where they were steeped in idol worship. The fact that they only watched and did not participate, in reality, was Herculean. No, Moshe wasn't angry at them. Moshe was angry at himself. If he hadn't questioned God's wisdom, if he hadn't taken Micha out of the wall, then maybe, even if there's a calf, at least it's not walking and talking. And if he hadn't brought the Erev out of Egypt with the Jewish nation, then maybe no one makes a calf in the first place. So his anger was real. He was angry at himself. It was he who questioned God's judgment and didn't even think enough 
to ask God's opinion about bringing along the heir of Rav. So Moshe goes up to the mountain for a second time to plead with God to forgive the Jewish nation. God in his anger tells Moshe that he will destroy the nation and start a new nation from Moshe. Moshe refuses. And he tells God in 32.32 to forgive the people's sin. And he adds, if not, Erase me from the book that you have written. It's interesting that the Pasuk is 32.32, the Gamachi of the word lave, heart, twice. Again, Moshe, the true lover of Israel. Now, the Hebrew word Mocheni can be broken up into two words. Me Noah, the waters of Noah, the flood. Zohar says that Moshe was a reincarnation of Noah. He had been severely criticized for not saving the world. And now, he had a second chance. Uh, he wasn't going to lose it. God forgives the Jewish nation in the merit of Moshe. We see here that Moshe gets angry, and it is seen in a positive light. However, there are three other places in the Torah where Moshe gets angry, and there it is seen as a negative. He forgets the law. What's the difference between them? And why did one have a positive conclusion and the others negative? I think that the answer is that the anger that Moshe displayed when he broke the tablets was anger that was directed towards himself. Whereas the other three times his anger was directed to others. This is why the Rambam tells us with all traits, always take the middle road. However, when it comes to arrogance and anger, be very humble and never get angry. They are really one and the same. The reason why we get angry is because our ego has been hurt. The first chapter in Pirkei Elbos begins with the words, Moshe, Kibbal Torah, May Sinai. Then Moses received the Torah from Mount Sinai. The wording is strange, and that it should have said, Al Har Sinai, on the mountain, not May Har Sinai, from the mountain. Moshe didn't receive the Torah from Sinai. He received it directly from God Almighty himself. So what is the wording of the Mishnah telling us? When God gave the Torah to the Jews, all the mountains in the world came before him and asked that the Torah should be given on them. Many were tall, others were beautiful. But God chose Sinai, a smaller, less impressive mountain that didn't even put in its request. It didn't feel itself worthy. But Moshe saw that God did choose Sinai for giving the Torah, not for its height, or beauty, but exactly for his humility. So Moshe learned the lesson of humility, May Sinai, from the mountain of Sinai itself. In fact, Moshe learned the lesson so well that in the fourth book of the Torah, in the portion of Baha'u'llah 12.3, God testifies that Moshe was Ish of Ma'od. Moshe was the humblest of all men. And the only reason that God would have to testify that he was the humblest of all men was that by his nature, he must have been an arrogant person. After all, he was brought up as a prince in the house of Paro. Then he was the king of Ethiopia, according to the Medrash, for 40 years. And then he served as the king of the Jewish nation for another 40 years. Arrogance comes with the job. Not only that, it is common for people with physical challenges to overcompensate their handicaps with a false sense of arrogance. So God himself testifies that Moshe was able to accomplish the most difficult feat in life. He overcame his own nature. He changed himself into a humble person, a staunch advocate for his people, and a true and dedicated servant of God Almighty. So from Moshe we learn many lessons. Number one, to never forget a kindness that someone has done for us. We learn not to judge the whole world, the whole nation, pardon me, because of the actions of a couple individuals. We learn that punctuality is a factor in life. We learn that being a leader of the Jews is not easy. We need to appreciate our leaders even before they die. We learn that anger can make the best of people, hair. We learn the necessity to connect to another person's feelings, whether in laughter or in tears. We need to unite with others, not just in war, but also in peace. We need to realize that age is just a number. It makes no difference what your age is. It makes a difference where your hopes and aspirations are. Where there is life, there is always opportunity. We need to learn from the mun that fell in the Moshe's merit 
that the taste and spirituality of the mother was dependent on one's mindset. So too our lives are predicated on our thoughts, our perception. The Mun was a daily report card, which, which the people found offensive. Yet it's the report card that helps us to try harder and to do better. There is a reason why Moshe is referred to as Moshe Rabbeinu, Moshe, our teacher. The Hadi of Shulis is here now. We celebrate that we have one God, one Torah, one Moshe, one people. Let us unite in one unified goal of bringing in the coming of Shia Sikainu quickly and in our time. Again, thank you very much for listening. And again, there should be a schut, a merit for the, our brethren in Israel. God should bring Mashiach. There should be peace. We've had enough of this. And God should bless you all with good health and happiness to you and to your families. And again, have a wonderful holiday, Shavuos, not just Shabbat, but Shavuos, which will be Sunday night. And uh, enjoy the cheesecake. God bless and be well. Thank you for listening.